call on another to worship the Lord. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. Let us worship our God.
about today, and the Bible is all about some love. But you know what? This is so cool. You don't have a good time. Well, you got time. But uh, anyway, um, what is it? If you think the Lord's going to send us a Valentine, we'll take a Valentine with a heart on it. No, what? Well, what is He giving? What What is He giving us as His gift of love? His Son, right on. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So He gives us a Valentine every single day of our lives in Jesus Christ. And we are so, so lucky. I went to a funeral yesterday of a wonderful member that used to be here, Ms. Francis Laster, and they kept talking about her having the, the, a heart a heart of Jesus and how we should always have a heart of Jesus and show love every day. How can we show Jesus' love every day? What are some ways we can show love? Not to be mean. Perfect. Don't be a bully. Don't be a bully. Anybody else have any ideas? Don't follow it. What you got? You'll tell me later. Okay. I got you. you. You might think I say this every single time, but Jesus wants you to show his love not just to your mom and your dad and your brothers and Everyone. sister. Everyone. You know that song, you'll know who your Christians by our love? Oh. Well, I hope to teach you. It's a great song. But it talks about people need to know that you're a Christian because you show love. You don't have to walk up and go, yay, hallelujah. All that's, that's not a bad thing. But you know what? They need to know that you're Christians by showing people love. And you know what? Love has so much to do with everything. There's even a verse that said, love should not be only words and talk. It's in John, 1 John 3.18. Also, it says, a happy heart full of love makes your face cheerful. Yay! So if you walk around filled with love, you're not going to be frowning all the time. It's going to make your face cheerful. That is actually in the Bible, in Proverbs. And another one said, in Proverbs 7.22, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Perfect. So if you walk around with God's love in your heart all the time, being nice, just be chill looking. Yeah. What if they're, you love them right back? You just love them. You take the high road and you show them Jesus' love. Okay. So that is our goal for this week. Not only to show love and give Valentine's to people that we love in our house, love on everybody. It's good medicine and it makes you smile. It makes you cheerful. Okay? Let's have a little prayer here. Lord, we thank you so much for your eternal Valentine, Jesus Christ. We just ask, Lord, that you keep love in our heart always. It's a week where we're all about love on a piece of paper. Just please allow us, Lord, and show us, Lord, and reveal to us how to show your love every day and all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
brothers and sisters in Christ, God is good. All the time. You know, you don't have the advantage of being able to sit up here, not only to be surrounded by the choir when they're singing so wonderfully, it literally just uh, envelops you, but also to watch the faces of the young children when they're in the midst of the children's sermon. My favorite part was when, when uh, Freddie made a suggestion that one of the ways you show God's love is on your face, and the response was a look like this. Yeah. <laughs> Kids never lie. They tell you exactly what they're thinking. Today we're going to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, and a wonderful story about the Israelites in the midst of their many years of wandering, what would end up being many years of wandering. We're going to look in chapter 16, so I invite you to take out your few Bibles, your personal ones, and join me there in the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 8. Listen now to the word of Almighty God as we find it here today. Now the whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elim, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. But the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me now? Almighty God, you have demonstrated throughout all the history of your people your providential care of them, your provision of their needs in times of want, your gift of grace and excessive blessing. We have witnessed again and again, Lord God, the many ways in which you have intervened into the world and transformed and changed those with whom you have had contact. You have given us the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, given us the opportunity to be enjoined with those who went before, those very self-same Israelites who were freed from the bonds of slavery in Egypt and brought ultimately to the land which you have promised to their people. We pray today, Lord God, that the power of the truth of this tale may reach each one of us, and that by your Holy Spirit being present with us, the words that we have shared may be joined together with the words that follow, that they may speak that one word that each of us has a need to hear today. And we pray these things, even as I pray that you would give me the gift of preaching and those here gathered ears to hear it and hearts to make it real. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Story told of a time that a pastor, a preacher, and a lawyer, and a doctor from his congregation went on out and they decided to go deer hunting. And they were out there in deer woods early in the morning and they saw this buck off in the distance. And this buck was absolutely huge. It was uh, something they've never seen before. It was absolutely massive. And immediately the three of them, in that very moment of time, raised their rifles, took aim, and fired and the buck fell to the ground. So they ran across the field and they went to try to determine who it was that had felled the deer, which shot it was that had killed the deer. There was only one, one sign of a witness of a, of a bullet that had entered the deer. And they were arguing with each other. They could not decide. The doctor said it was, it was him, it was me, he said, that I'm the one who felled the deer. 
And the lawyer said, no, 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 it was I. I remember, I, I aimed so closely, I'm sure I, it was me that did it. And the pastor, too, engaged in the argument. And just as they were in the heat of this discussion, a game warden who had heard all three shots go off at the same time was drawn to the field and came up upon them. And he looked at them and he asked them, what in the world are the three of you talking about? And they said, well, we were arguing about who was a shot the buck. Well, the Lord says, I can tell you immediately who did it. And they said, who? And the Lord looked at the, at the three and he said, well, it's obvious. It was the preacher who killed the deer. And they looked at him strangely and said, well, how do you know? How would you possibly know that it was the preacher who killed, killed the deer? He said, it's very simple. He said, look down here and he pointed. He says, he says, just like his sermons on Sundays when he's preaching to the two of you, the bullet went in one ear and out the other and didn't spend any time in between. <laughs> you laugh when it happens more often than you think. Oh, I know there are lots of times that people come here and they, they look like they're paying attention. I can tell you when the service is over and people are coming out and they tell you, that was a great sermon, and I hadn't even preached that day because it was a special thing that I did. <laughs> you know, I know that things have gone in and gone through and nothing stayed in between. But I really shouldn't complain, but then again, everybody complains, am I right? We all complain. I'm blessed to have a congregation that really does pay attention. You really are interested in hearing God's word. You're interested in learning and growing in your faithfulness. And yet, I have to tell you, complaints are constant, always in any organization, in every group, even in the church. And preachers can do it, they can complain. They, they may have, be blessed like I am to have folks like you out here paying attention just like you are right now. Not one of you is not off to sleep. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> and while you're preaching and you're feeling like you're making contact, you can see their faces and you can see their response and you can tell that in their heart of hearts the Spirit is moving and they're listening and they're... They're absorbing it, and it's becoming part of who they are. Still, sometimes a preacher will stand up here in the pulpit, and he'll be preaching, and he'll be doing that, and he'll be working, and still he's thinking to himself, as he looks around at the empty spaces in the pew, I wonder where those folks are today. And then kind of the congregations, too, they complain as well. <laughs> They may be blessed with every kind of resource imaginable, wonderful people in their congregation, everything going smoothly, and still there'll be moments of time in which the men and women of the church will suddenly rise up and start to complain about how they really wish they had what that other church across town had going for them. And they're no different than the people of Israel, as we discover when we look really closely at the text that we shared a few moments ago. Let's, let's take a look again. And what it is that we just read a moment ago. Now you need to understand at this point in time, they've been, they've been out there in the wilderness for about 15 months or so, it says. And they've been traveling around. They've been delivered literally out of, the, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, as the scriptures tell us. They've been working hard in that situation. The more that, they were, that, that Pharaoh was implored to let them go, the harder they made them work. And the work was difficult and hard. They had, they had folks who were uh, working for Pharaoh, literally yelling at those Israelites, telling them to make more bricks and use less straw. Make more bricks, use less straw. It was a terrible situation. Now, they did have food to eat, but other than that, it was really a torturous kind of environment in which to live. And they'd been living this way from generation to generation for some period of time. And it had been ultimately very difficult for them. And in the midst of all of that, now listen closely to this, they had lived so long in captivity that they had forgotten from whence they had come. Even more importantly, they forgot the God who had named them and claimed them in the first place. They were lost. They were broken. They were in need of rescue. And so what happens? God intervenes. It just doesn't intervene and kind of wave a wand over the land and suddenly everything is great and you wander out and everything's fine. They had to go through a series of experiences and Pharaoh had to be convinced 
through those plagues that were laid upon Egypt in order for them to understand the importance of who the real one true God was. <coughs> and so also that not only the Egyptians would learn this and Pharaoh would learn this, but also that these Israelites, these Hebrew people, would also come to an understanding that they're not talking about just any God or some kind of a God or some demigod that exists out there, but the one true God, the one God that is not impotent, the one that can actually do something to make a difference in their lives so that they would know who he was and they would then follow him and God would be their God and they would be God's people. This was the plan. Finally, they followed as Moses and Aaron led them out and down by the Red Sea. And in that situation, when the Pharaoh came with all of his armies and he was riding along with his chariots and they were with their backs up against the waters and the, and the enemy approaching fast upon them, you remember the story, God parted the waters and allowed them to go across in safety. And then when Pharaoh went into the water with his, with his soldiers and others, he closed the water on them and he drowned them and he got them out of the way forever thereafter. And now the people of God were in the wilderness. And they were on their way to the promised land that God had promised them, but it would take some time. And it would require that they be faithful. They needed to learn how to be faithful. And so what did God do? Did he leave them out there in the wilderness to fend for themselves, to figure out what they were going to do, to scavenge food from the ground around them? No. What God did was give them, not only with the provisions that they brought with them when they left, but he guided and directed them. He put the pillar of fire before them and the pillar of smoke so they would always know that the Lord God was with them in everything. A constant reminder that God had not abandoned them. And every time they ran into a difficulty or a trouble, any time they experienced a, a situation in which they were desperate for help, God always intervened when they had no water to drink. God took the brackets brack and bad water and he made it sweet water so they could consume it and not go thirsty. And now he had been bringing them, as he did throughout this whole journey from place to place, into the land of sin, Sinai area is what we think it is. And he brings them there, and it is a desolate place. If you've ever been to that area, you know it is a desolate place. There's nothing really growing there. And they had not enough provisions of their own to be able to feed themselves. And they became, listen closely now, hungry. Hungry. Not starving, just hungry. And God had provided for them every single thing they needed to this point in time. And now they began to grumble. It was directed at Moses and Aaron, but it wasn't really about them, you see, because the situation that causes this, this constant uh, problem of mumbling murmurs of malcontented members always begins with a spirit of ingratitude, a failure to recognize the power of God to intervene and to make better the situation in which you find yourself. Complaining, you see, is easy to do. It is easy to complain about the circumstances you find yourself in. But if you remember all of the many blessings that happened to you along the way in your life, and you realize the many times in which you found yourself maybe hungry, and God provided that morsel of food you needed to sustain your body to move forward. Maybe it wasn't a feast. Maybe it was an overwhelming table full to overflowing, a, a beautiful banquet to eat from, but it was enough to sustain your body so you could begin again the next day. These are the blessings that God provides day in and day out to us in our lives. And he had done the very self-same thing to all of them. And yet they began to complain. It was as if God had never intervened in their lives and helped them. It would have been better if they began to cry. If you had just killed us, God, as we sat at the flesh pots, and we at least were full in our bellies when we died. It was as if they were trying to tell God that what God had done after all of this work was to drag them into the midst of a desert. He had rescued them out of bondage. He had freed them from the hard work, the terrible tasks that were performed that were made even more egregious as time had gone on. He had freed them from all that. He had delivered them from the dangers of the army that was coming after them. He had taken them into the wilderness, promised to take them to the promised land that they had been promised many, many generations before. And now they think 
that God must have taken them to this place out there in the midst of the desert just so they will prostrate themselves on the desert floor and die and wither for lack of food. Can you imagine the lack of memory that has to go into something like that and the incredible amount of ingratitude that that represents? You know, I'm reminded of the story the six-year-old boy. The six-year-old boy had never spoken not from birth to six years old. Never said a single word. Nothing had ever come out of that child's mouth. Everybody couldn't figure it out. His vocal cords were fine. Everything seemed to be working in there. Couldn't understand why this kid didn't say anything. He just didn't say anything. One day, mom and dad give the kid a cup of cocoa. Right? And then, suddenly, a strange thing happened. The boy had a strange look on his face. He looked at his parents, and then in a grumbling, complaining tone, the kid said, this cocoa's no good! The parents were shocked. They were stunned. They were amazed. Then they started to wonder, wait a minute. When did this kid learn how to speak? And why didn't he say anything until now? So they asked him, you know, Johnny, why didn't you say anything up until now? And he said to them very simply, he says, well, to now, everything was pretty much okay. <laughs> All the blessings of little Johnny's life were washed away with one cup of cocoa he didn't like. The world is full of people who forget the blessings that God has given them. But the worst thing that happens ever is when the church of Jesus Christ forgets the blessings he has given them. You know, as I surveyed this congregation and the circumstance we find ourselves in today, I am absolutely delighted. I am thrilled. Let me tell you. I don't hear any murmuring, uh, malcontented commentary. Not a word. I haven't heard anything in months. It's pretty amazing, actually. It's pretty wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? Everything's going really well. It's amazing. We, we had lived for a period of time under kind of a self induced slavery and we have been freed from that and we have got a common mission and a common purpose and we have adopted that and adapted to that and we are moving forward with it we are in the wilderness still we've been freed from the bondage that we had once been in but now we are moving forward and we have been blessed incredibly blessed all manner of resources and men and women who are stepping up to the plate to do all kinds of new things in the midst of this congregation and to take up its mission in the world around us. And that's a remarkable and wonderful thing to have happen. But the problem is that we must be careful. Now that things are going well and we are moving forward and we're adding new members and we're expanding our witness into the community and beyond, in this point in time when things seem to be going well, that's the moment in time in which people begin to start losing their memories. They begin to forget all the many blessings that God has given them. They forget that they have been freed from the bondage they've been living in, and now they are brought together in one unified purpose to go forward in faithfulness, to do the things that God has put before us to do, to make new Christians in the world, to feed and clothe and house and shelter the people who are lost, the least them, and alone, to literally love one another as we say we love God. And doing that, empowering ourselves to be able to nurture each other to go and serve in the world. These are the blessings that we have before us, the purpose that God has given us. This is the heart of who we are supposed to be as a congregation. And we are adopting this idea and we are moving forward in that direction. And we must guard against any attempt by anyone to thwart or stop by murmuring or complaint the forward direction of what we are doing in the congregation. You know why? Because, it, see, the, the complaints for the people of Israel, I promise you, didn't start as one big giant protest. Just like the protests that are happening around the country, complaining right now, all of those protests, they didn't just happen with suddenly everybody woke up one day and said, let's go gather together at the same place. It starts with a person who tells somebody else, who then organizes it with somebody else. And it starts always with the first complaint, joined by the second, and the affirmation by the third, and on and on and on it goes until it becomes a swell, a ground swell, that causes the people to forget the blessings they have and to focus only on the negatives. And we cannot afford as a congregation ever to slip into that kind of a world, ever, if ever we have in the past, again. 
You know, I remember a story a friend of mine told me once about a pond. He, he, he heard this pond was falling in. He heard croaking at night, and it was loud croaking. And he thought to himself, lived just outside of one of these really fancy kind of uh, communities where they had the fancy restaurants where they served all kinds of fancy things. And he thought to himself, wow, I need to buy that pond. There must be hundreds, maybe thousands of frogs in there, and I can sell the frog legs to the restaurants in town, and I'm going to make a fortune. So he made a deal with the farmer who owned the pond, and he bought the pond. And then he decided he was going to drain the pond so he could get all the frogs out. You know what he discovered when he got to the bottom? There was just one big bullfrog who had been making all that noise. You hear what I'm saying? Can I have an amen? Amen. We are blessed, you and I, in this congregation with the mission that God has put before us to do. We have an opportunity to literally remember the blessings that he has given us and to hold fast to those truths and to move forward in faithfulness. we got great and wonderful leaders who are leading this church forward. We need to trust them and follow them and, and trust them. Give them your input. Input is great. But trust them in their leadership. They know where they're going. God has given them that mission. Trust them and follow. And if we do that together, I promise you that we will be blessed in ways that you cannot imagine. But even more importantly, now listen closely to this. Even more importantly to how much we are blessed as a congregation, the real proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. The proof of the pudding of this blessedness is in the difference in the lives of the men and women we encounter in the world around us. That is the proof. If we take the blessings that God has given us and we hoard them all for ourselves, God will not give us any more. The manna that we've been blessed to have, the meat that we are privileged to eat, if we do not eat it in the time that we have been given it, our daily bread, as Jesus himself says in his prayer, we will surely lose it. If we seek to stockpile and hoard the blessings that we have, our gifts, skills, and talents, our material resources. God will cut off the flow. But if we're faithful, and we remember that in good times and hard times, God is with us always. And He always gives us what we need. We will be blessed. Blessed not just for us in our generation, but for the generations that follow after us. And that is our purpose. And let us never ever forget how blessed we have been in this congregation to follow after men and women who preceded us and had that level of confidence and faith in God's direct providential care for them. That we are blessed to sit in the sanctuary they built to minister in the buildings they provided, and to reach out into the world around us with a mission that they have been faithful to since the inception of this establishment of a church. May God bless us in our ministry going forward, and may we each work hard in our own hearts to mute those murmuring, meandering words of complaint when we have them. Let us pray. Lord God, again and again and again you demonstrate that when we trust and have faith in you, you never disappoint us. Teach us, Lord God, to have an attitude of gratitude and to stifle the ingratitude that can often come. Let us not be envious of others. Let us be grateful for the blessings you've given to us here in this place. Help us, Lord God, to build our ministry, to go forward in faith, not for our sake or our own purpose, but for your sake and your kingdom. For we ask this in Christ's name. And all God's children said.
standing as we proclaim what we believe to be the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Please be seated. And 
living God from whom comes every good and perfect gift, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness. We give thanks for all of the blessings of this life from your bounty, and above all, for your immeasurable love and redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. Take our lives for your service and accept these humble gifts in support of that service. May they be used in a way wholly acceptable in your sight, both in this community and beyond. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to all be all the honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. 